Okay, streaming. Okay, good morning, friends uh, in California or in the US, and good evening to my friends, family, and everybody else in India or in Asia. I have a very special guest and a special friend, uh, P. Gauri Shankar, with me today. Good evening, Gauri. Good evening, uh, Rajat. It's great to see you yeah. after a long time. <laughs> Absolutely. So I would say, in, you know, in our hometown or in Karnataka, we say Namaskara Swami Hegi. Namaskara. Yeah. New Hegi Dirali. Paragala, sir. Arama. So in Arama, but you know, Arama. so the, the reason why we wanted to have this conversation is because we are in very interesting times. And I talk about resilience all the time resilience of the body, resilience of the mind, resilience of society, but more importantly, resilience of the environment. Right? For us to thrive and to survive, it is really important for us to live in harmony with nature. So I really wanted to interview and have a conversation with Gauri Shankar, who I believe is the Tarzan of India. He looks like a Tarzan. You can't look at him that way. He stands up and he shows six-pack abs and all that. <laughs> I've, see, I've seen this man uh, in the jungles of Agumbe, the Western Ghats, which is a tropical rainforest of India. So I'm excited about this conversation, but before I get into the conversation, I want to do a quick intro of Gauri, so you all have a context of who this man is and why it is so important for us to listen to his viewpoints. And uh, we're gonna have a really lively conversation today. So Gauri Shankar is a wildlife biologist studying king cobras, you know, not, not, not any cobra, but the king cobra for close to two decades. And then I, I, there's a good childhood stories of him we'll get into. He's pursuing his PhD in North Orissa University in Odisha, India, and is a former exchange student, student at Upasa University in Sweden. He has authored and co-authored 11 scientific papers on king cobras and has 10 papers on herpetology topics. He has rescued and relocated over 350 king cobras from distress situations and monitored over 35 king cobra nests. And this might be very interesting, king cobra nests. King yes. cobras are probably the only snakes which have nests. Exactly. Yes. And they are very, they really take care of their, of their, yes. uh, I would say eggs for over two to three eggs. months, starving, yes. right? Yes. So this is yes. really special. For us to really understand yes. this, this demystify this amazing animal. He was instrumental in, in initiating the pioneering radio telemetry studies of King Cobras. He has been featured in several wildlife documentaries on Nat Geo, Discovery, Animal Planet, and Cobra King. In 2015, he was awarded the Herpetologist of the Year by the Swedish Herpetological Society. The TEDx speaker. He runs, I would think, one of the most former, foremost conservation uh, centers. I had the privilege of spending a couple of days and I really think about it. I need to get back there as soon as possible. It's the Kalinga Center for Rainforest Eco Ecology, KCRE, and the Kalinga Foundation. So, welcome, Gauri. That's a lot of Thank uh, you. amazing stuff. <laughs> Thank so, you, Pranacha. So, to tee this conversation, I want to take a quote from you know, Jane Goodall, and uh, you know, who is I would say the foremost person when it comes to yes. conservation and kind of this champion of, uh, you know, of conservation. And she said this, yeah? here we are, arguably the most intelligent beings that ever walked the planet Earth with this extraordinary brain, yet we are destroying the only home we have, right? So with that, you know, it is kind of ironic and hopefully this pandemic is a wake up call that it is so fragile, we are connected but if you do small things, it will also kind of heal itself. So with that, let us kind of uh, talk about Agumbe, the rainforest, and why this ecosystem is so important for us. And then obviously the King Cobra as your favorite topic. Sure. So why don't we start with why are King Cobras so important for us in, in conservation today? <clears throat> We're talking about rainforests. Um, uh, uh, people wouldn't understand if you directly tell them we have to conserve. I would put that in a different perspective, saying 18 to 20 percent of our carbon sink produced by human beings is taken by the rainforest of the world, right? And Western Ghat being one of the hottest biodiversity hotspot in the world, so the water we get to the entire South India is from these parts and. To protect the species, uh, to protect the rainforest, we need a glamorous or a flagship species. So my previous boss and many of us, we always think the king cobra has a chance to be a flagship species or a, such a charismatic animal, you know, mm -hmm. growing up to five meters and possessing enough venom to, ten, uh, to kill 10 people, but 
still a very gentle snake which can think and move a okay, safe distance from human beings and coexist right at the time at the same time uh, we as people like you mentioned we are destruct destruct uh, destroying the entire habitat and uh, i don't know whether you heard recently this hubber uh, hubberley ankola railway uh, mm. line plan was sanctioned by our chief minister which is going to uh, fell close to 200000 uh, mm. trees so that's going to be a big problem for king cobra so king cobra are important if you want to protect the forest so we try to project king cobra as a flagship species in the entire southeast asia which is which has one of the most important uh rainforest in the world other than our uh, south america and uh, africa so southeast asia is one of the major uh, tropical rainforest we have and then also it basically converts all the way from agum bay and north to, to my hometown kodagu in the south and these right. railway lines are going to wreak havoc and i think when you yes. talk about specifically the western ghats can you share with us there are two or three species which you think are endangered are, are really on this list of uh, you know both on flora and fauna which you think is like very unique to that particular you know segment sure so one of the major species where uh, conservation has been talking about is the lion tail macaque i don't know whether you heard ltm we call it as one of the primate which is found only in western ghats nowhere else and you don't see them in northeast not in eastern ghats no worries so this is endemic species and they are canopy dwelling animals so if you cut down trees and make a road which is about maybe 50 meters 100 meters that means you are separating two populations they don't even come down walk the road and go to the next patch of forest so they are canopy they need canopies to move around so one road can divide a population into two populations so that's a wow. major catastrophic yeah you can't do that so i don't do it do, we, days, do people even do people even think i mean this is when you talk about canopy no. and they just don't even get to the ground and when you go talk to let's say uh, a civil engineer or or a highway national highway engineer for them it's like let's put a road i don't think it even occurs right to them that no you are no yeah. that's why How we have this environment environmental impact assessment is done but a few yeah. ngos will be part of it or the forest department we all have to sit together and unfortunately these public hearings also not done properly right. so this uh, hubli ankola railway line was was uh, sanctioned just before uh, the lockdown so you can't even right. file a case and people other pe- people are the conservation are trying to do something but you know very smartly they they plan this move so and, and this is very interesting I'm, kilometers wow and I, the reason I want to have this conversation because i'm sitting here in san diego and you know and yes uh, and gauri shankar is in bengaluru i think you know but we are intrinsically connected we one thing this yes. virus has taught us that there's no separation right so i want no, to say is that no. if the western ghats are destroyed i can i can be safely say they probably can't have a cup of co- starbucks coffee in california right because if yes. the western ghats do not replenish itself the river kari kaveri goes dry most yes. of south yes. india doesn't have water Guess what? Yes. You're out. Are you outsourcing call centers in Bangalore? Your engineering centers in Bangalore are shutting down. No. The yes. network, you, you, the infrastructure is going to shut down. And guess what? The drive-through coffee we get in Starbucks won't happen, right? And that's a Nothing. metaphor. Nothing. Yes. That's a metaphor for life. That you know that Amazon delivery happens so conveniently. If these centers, we are all intrinsically connected. That's why we. It, this yeah. preservation is a global effort. Right? and that's why i really want to highlight your conversation today so yes yeah, so i think the that the amazing species when we talk about we talk about the lion tail macaque anything else you want to highlight in that conversation so there are hundred uh, the several uh, frogs particularly the amphibians they are the indicator right. of a ecosystem so many right. species have been discovered recently from western right. ghats like right. every uh, every meter you go let's say 50 to 100 meters elevation the frog species are changing right they don't yeah. come down they don't right. go up so each occupy a particular niche so one mm-hmm. niche one dam or even a road uh, or a development activity that particular population might become extinct so there are many species yeah. like that even snakes malabar pit viper is an endemic species yeah so, so let's talk about let's talk about the king cobra 
you know, when you've been working on this for two decades now, you know, you're kind of, yes. I would say the foremost, you started initially collaborating with Ron Whitaker, who was one of yes. the you know, pioneers in the King Cobra, but you have really uh, been so passionate. How did you start? I know the stories of our good friend Vinod Gauda said that you always were rescuing snakes in high school and school. And how did you, yeah. how, you know, people talk about dogs, cats, you know, maybe some other thing, but snakes, how did you, especially in Bangalore, in India, where snakes are kind of really kind of, you know, you keep an arms and distance and rightfully so because they're venomous. How did you get into this? Okay, so the Bangalore wasn't like this 20 years ago. You you know how the Bangalore right. was 20, 25 years ago, right? When I was in school, it was beautiful, you know? The temperature, we never used fans. And now these days, every house is like AC. The temperature, right. I'm sure it's gone up to three to four degrees more. So beautiful place when we constructed our house in the outskirts, which I'm talking, it's not outskirts anymore. Uh, this is very close to IT Park where you live, uh, right. live on that road, Whitefield. right? Yeah. Uh, Whitefield. Care right from, so that's where we had our house, you know, that was house. Right. I used to catch snakes right there and people wouldn't right. believe if I tell them there. Yeah. yeah. So the one, I was always fascinated by wildlife. We didn't have Google. We didn't have what national geographic or whatever, whatever the magazines I would get from school library. That's all the source I had. And I think Durdashin, they used to play some wildlife documentaries about tigers and elephants. That's the only source yeah. I remember, you know. I always dreamt about living in a place in Agumbe or any rainforest. I don't know how I got into that. I want to live in a place like that, work there, and just spend time with snakes or wildlife. That's all I wanted to do, right? So you're but truly, you're truly, wild... you're truly, man, you're truly Mandi Namaga then. Yes, yeah. Mandi Namaga. I just wanted to live there. No industries, <laughs> no factories, no software, no doctor, engineers. I, nothing used to yeah. come into it. I just wanted to live in the forest. The only wildlife you would see where people were so um, uh, scared and they hated this particular animal is snakes. I've seen people yeah. killing them. So when I was in school, I couldn't confront them, the adults. Yeah. But when I, I, I caught my first snake when I was in ninth standard, like 13 or 14 years, very quietly. So once I become bolder and got into college, you know, you become a rowdy. Then I started yeah. confronting people when they kill snakes. So, the, the question they asked us, what are you going to do? How are we going right. to live with it? So that's when the rescue thing come, came up. Right. So now I'm going to catch it, capture it and release it back. So they were happy. So that's how my connection with snakes started. Then I started going to Banagata National Park. I had a bike. I would drop my sisters to the college and go straight to Banagata just to look at these king cobras, stay there whole day, look into them, into the enclosures, see whatever they do and come back and pick up my sister. So bunk the colleges, college and right. spend more time with King Cobras in Banagata. That's how I started working with snakes and King Cobras. Fantastic. And then you've done amazing work in conservation. You know, my, my, off my house in Bangalore, Whitefield, there are regularly yes. a couple of snakes on the property, like yes. in the house. Yes. Like, and I don't know what it is now, but literally outside my doorstep, there are one or two of yes. them, you know, there. So I think a lot of snakes are coming out. And the good, yes. the good thing is that the community I live in, they're very uh, aware. So they got, got very good catch and release techniques, which are happening. Yes. Yes. But there is this human conflict, right? As urban, yes. after urbanization, yes. we are seeing a lot of this conflict. And the snakes are very mystical creatures. And I've, obviously, there's no sympathy for them. So let's talk about yes. king cobras. And uh, when you started doing this conservation, how did you get into king cobras? Obviously, it, 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 it's like a, a good flagship uh, animal to kind of uh, use in your thing. Can you share some tips about king cobras and share what things people don't know about them? What should people know oh, about king cobras? Right? Like you mentioned, king cobras, uh, king cobras are the only species out of 3,000 or 3,000 species of snakes in the world which builds a nest to incubate, it, incubate their eggs. And like you mentioned, one of the most dedicated mother, I would say, she would hang around on the nest for close to 60 days, sometimes 70 days, just guarding the nest, no food, no water, nothing. In case right. if there is a wine snake or a bronze back tree snake or rat snake passing by, the mother would grab and eat and just settle down right. there. By the way, right. she would, and I've seen uh, king cobras in Northeast, which are this thick, the females, right. the beginning of the uh, breeding season become right. so thin. They would have lost a lot of weight, like close to two to three kilos, like. 60, I mean, 40% of their weight is lost because of 
the protection they give to the nest. That's something uh, no other snakes would do. Mm-hmm. Of course, pythons sometimes they coil around the eggs and they stay there. Uh, and uh, other than that, I think or most of the people, of course, we don't have scientific backup for this, but people mm-hmm. who work with king cobras, they would definitely agree with me. They are they are smartest. They are the smartest uh, among the snakes. They can. It looks like they think. They look at you and they, they you know, they, they know what exactly you're going to do next. You know, they're going to, they're not going to strike blindly like Russell Viper or a cobra. They're going to think and then go exactly for your feet or your hands. So they know, they can, they can have an image of you, right? right. They think. Right. I think. I've, I've seen this many times. Right. Right. So these are the two important things which and I. They think. also, are, they also are diurnal species, right? Contrary to they're what diurnal. people think. They're, they're diurnal yes, species, they're which is very different. And what Very I also found fascinating, and they're the, lot, the, they're the longest venomous snake in the world, right? Yes. And uh, what I also find fascinating about king cobras is that uh, obviously uh, they're very loud, right? When they breathe, they literally have a breath. Yeah. Right? And yes. It's they growl, like, actually. They growl, they growl, right? Growl. They, yeah. It's one it of the snakes fasc- which, which can growl, yes. And what I find fascinating is uh, I've seen some of your videos in the, the selection of the males compete. It's like this. Yes. They're, they're probably, are there other snakes which eat other snakes? Because their primary diet is other snakes, right? Yes. Uh, they feed exclusively on other snakes and they're right. cannibalistic in nature. So they don't mind eating their own species, except right. during breeding. A male will look at a female as female. After the breeding season, if he bumps into her, he will look at her as a food and uh, he will eat her. Yeah, the larger the species, the smaller one will be eaten up. But there are other snakes like crates which do feed on other snakes. But in their diet, even the frogs, rats, or birds fall into their menu. But king cobras cannot digest hair or feathers. So okay. they feed only on other snakes. So they can digest scales or snakes, right? right? They can't digest a rat or a, a rat or a bird because they have feather and uh, hair. So that, that's how their digestive systems are designed. Wow, wow, fascinating. Also, tell me a little bit about, yes. you know, when you look at, when I was when I was trying to understand snake, and this is something you told me, like the mother guards viciously the, for 60 days, but just before yes. the, the hatch, she leaves. Exactly, right? yes. yes. And, and yes. what is the logic in that? What is that? What is the logic for that? So, actually, we have, we don't have enough data on that, but what, uh, like you mentioned, Mr. Vitek or, or me or people who work with King Cobra, we think because it's time for her to leave uh, because she hasn't fed for almost 60 to 70 days, right? right? And she's hungry. And the instinct will take over because the hunger will take over. So what if she's still hanging around there and there are about 25 to 30 babies which, are, which, which comes out of the eggs and she en- ends up feeding on her own hatchlings. So that's not going to be good, right? So that, I think that's why she leaves... Right. And this is such an important point I want to make today is like, when you yes. talk about consciousness of species, yes. we, we think we humans have the most yes. biggest prefrontal cortex, but we kill yes. with no reason. No. Right? Yes, we, exactly. we bomb, we hunt, we attack war, we rage thing, we rape yes. and pillage, but absolutely yes. no reason other than greed. Right? Exactly. But exactly. if you look at the king cobra and the mother literally leaving because the instinct says, you know, instinct I, let, yes. let me let me not make a mistake in my hunger. Yes. And that's something yes. we as humans is talking about karuna or compassion. Yes. Right? Compassion. And that's something yes. as, as a species, I think this pandemic should I think hopefully it'll come in within us and instill in us this this sense of yes. compassion because the king cobra it doesn't need to be because mythologically it's kind of like this kind of you know chaos is more compassionate than us right? yes yes and that's something i think when i reflected on this conversation i said that's amazing to do that so when you when you watch over 35 nests you know king cobra yes. nest you monitor what are some of your learnings what would what were some of the key takeaways from that uh, um, like again i would uh, bring it back to the intelligence you know uh, I need to establish this, but the way right. the female will uh, will uh, will uh, uh, look for a space or a, right. a select site selection. The right. nesting site selection is brilliant. Right. You know, most of the nests are in the slope like this, and right. there is a tree here, and the nest is right here, so that the tree will protect the nest. At the same time, early morning, not early morning, from between 
12 to 3 or 11 to 4 is the time where the the sun shines right. in the rainforest, right? Because of the canopy. In the gaps, the sun has to fall, the rays has to fall on the nest and incubate their eggs, right? right. right. So there should Beautiful. be enough sun for the incubation during right. summer. At the same right. time, monsoon, the right. king doesn't want to build a nest in open where the, the rain is so much, will right. damage the nest. And the uh, nest is built so... Uh, Brilliantly, not even a single drop of 3,000 or 4,000 mm, mm of rainfall in the rainforest doesn't reach the nest. And this is an nest important chamber. point. By the way, Agumbe and the Western Ghats, Agumbe has one of the exactly. most wettest, wettest regions in India, right? Yes. So very 8,000 mm of rainfall. Yes. Very heavy rain. Not even a so many single, single, drop. single drop will not reach the nest. And so, that's, so just think about, brilliant. think about the intelligence, right? So when you talk about Vastu yes. Shastra, we think we are so smart that we know how to do north facing, east facing and all that. Exactly. These exactly. animals were so tuned in, tuned in yes. to the biosphere yes. that they knew how to do yes. that. Today, I think if you, yes. if you give me all the materials, of furniture, can you design a house where water won't leak? I don't think I could do yeah. it on my own. Right? No, no. no I, I would think, challenge that. Right. So I think this is amazing. So for us, we need to understand that is, you know, Rumi said God's language is silence. Everything else is poor translation. I would like to say that God's language is nature also, and yes. everything else is poor translation. So yes. in nature, we can learn, we can learn to love, to learn to nurture. And I think one of the things I want to, I guess people to take back from this conversation is that the king cobras are not only important, they're intelligent, they're compassionate yes. creatures. Yes. And what we need is for us as humans to educate ourselves, right? Because yes. once we educate yes. ourselves, then I think we can do a better job. So let's talk about yes. education. You have been in, you know, really helping the farmers and the people in the villages in Agumbe, really catching and releasing them because king cobras are all the houses and all these nooks and corners. Tell me, uh, tell me your any any interesting points you want to raise with respect to human con human king cobra com conflict in Agumbe and what are you doing about it? Agumbe, one of the best place to work because people there, I think, in the entire world, that's the only place in. Uh, our South Canada and Dakshin Canada, whatever this place, you know, Malnad region, where king cobras are revered and worshipped. Right. Right. So half of our battle, the conservationist battle, is one because people are not killing them. The actual way, this is, is this other is, parts this of is, the world. This is very interesting, right? So there is a song in Canada which says "Avina Rosha Hanedu Varsha." Hanedu Varsha, but no, <laughs> that's a very nice song. But no, it's very good. I'm very grateful it's for that very, song because. Yeah. The song said Havina Rosha and Varsha, which in English says yeah. that the 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 rat of the king of the cobra lasts for 12 years. And people well, sing yes, this yeah. song. But I'm yes. so grateful for that song because at least because of that there was conservation. Right? Yes. People yes. say we don't want to kill the cobra because you know what? For 12 years it's gonna hunt you down. Yeah. And maybe hunt we need down. these yes. stories of conservation which come from those lyrics. These are right? yes. Yes, I would uh, say these are positive conservation uh, messages we have. Uh, so, yeah, the people here, they don't kill them. I've been in Bangalore, you know, sometimes I, I get a call. Gauri, there is a call. Uh, there's a king cobra in the house. What, what do we do? Okay, I'm in Bangalore. Can I take a night bus and I'll be there tomorrow morning? Is that okay? They say, yeah, yeah, it's fine. They lock, lock down the entire house. They go and sleep in their neighbor's house or their sister's house or brother's house, they'll never disturb the snake. So and I'll be so in the morning. I, I have to agree with exactly. you. My, my community, they watch over, yes. they call the conservation, the catch and release. Yes. Right? There's some release awareness there. Right. Exactly. It's, it's, they, they consider that as their uh, God. You know, uh, People ask me whether I believe in God or go to temples. No, forest is my temple. King Cobra is my God or tiger is my God or even a... Uh, a civet cat is my god. So all these right. animals I look at as god. So right. king cobras are protected. They, they, you know, that's that's a belief in Malnad. I know I'm sure even in Kul, if right. the king cobra passes through or right. just passes through their plantation, that year they're going to get a bumper price crop. That's right. something great, you know. Right. Positive. And I think the, you know, this, for these positive stories, I think it's important. So you, from your perspective, you know, you, you feel that because of this reverence to the king cobra, yes. right? Yes. Uh, there is a certain amount of deference. So at least people, the first instinct is not to kill it, but at least to call for yes. help, right? 
Yes. But you also have been running amazing education. I want to talk about education programs. What I love about yes. what you're doing is that when I came there, I was educated, right? There's only yes. so much they, they can do a look, look at a lot of stuff on, online and great, but once you go and live there, be there, feel the energy, yes. the vibration, it's so different. So you've done yes. both. You have an amazing, so people who are listening, when this lockdown is over, you will need to recharge and reboot yourself. So go check out yes. uh, this amazing uh, resort retreat, rather, not even resort, retreat and research. Not center. resort, yeah. Not <laughs> resort. I hate to use the word field, resort because. Field station, field, field, yeah. Field station, research research station. Research, research, yeah. So research center. And really, I'm um, absorbed it. So talk about your KCRE, your, how you're educating the youth in, in online, in schools in Bangalore, Mysore, and then, you know, generally what you're doing also offline and now Sure. So the research is one part where we, we, we found, uh, find the interesting uh, aspects of the species or whichever species you love to work on. But how do we protect the species or conserve the species unless we all get together? So my, the other uh, objective is to whatever I learn through my entire team, I have a really wonderful team. So we reach out to the local people and tell them how interesting these creatures are and how important these forests are. So that's how, first and foremost, whenever there's a rescue, there are about 50 to 100 people gathering, right? Mm -hmm. I take advantage of that. I talk to them, convey the message. That's a live audience right there. So that I make advantage. I use... I take that as an advantage. And, and, I, and I, know, I know you have a good sense of humor. You said people are taking videos here because they want to see whether a snake is going to bite in the gully. Yeah. What's, what's, <laughs> what's, 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 what's a climax yes. here? <laughs> climax. Yeah, I've caught king cobras in the wells, on the roofs. So they're always excited to see whether, how I'm, I mean, how I get bitten and die. You know, how people love that <laughs> thrilling experience. So, but I'm, I'm quite, uh, quite calm while doing this. So that is the message. That's the time I talk to them over the conservation. And at the same time, we go visit the local schools, colleges, the villages. I try to play documentaries, videos, and uh, and uh, talk uh, and presentations. So we reach out to people, whatever we learn about King right. Cobras. Other than that, this message, like I said, in the entire Southeast Asia, I think only in Malnar people revere and worship them. This story, I take it to other parts of the a king cobra habit and tell them, look, our people coexist with them. I have videos and photographs how cooperate they are. So I show them and create that positive uh, message in Thailand or in Nepal or in Eastern Ghats in Andhra Pradesh or uh, Orisha, wherever I go, even in Andamans, I've spoken to forest department, people, uh, cops, your coastal guard, fire department. So this is what I try to do. And we train them. Professionally, we equip them uh, with the knowledge. And I also try to give them the rescue kit. It's very, very important. Nowadays, people watch us ca capturing snakes on tube, YouTube or they think it's easy and they get bitten and then die. Right. So right. I try to equip them with all the knowledge. And Storm right. so, uh, is my brainchild. Uh, right. Scientific training on rep uh, reptile management. We right. do this quite often in India and over 500 plus People have been trained and they're doing really good. Some of them who got trained, they're rescuing King Cobras. So that's my objectives are met. And also for people, I think, uh, listening to this conversation, you know, when you're looking at supporting different organizations, KCRE yes. is, a, is, a, is a foundation. So I think uh, it's an NGO. So do donate support. We'll share a link online where people can, they can, they can donate online, right? Is an online? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Yeah, they can. We, we I, and I, and I really believe, because having been there, having been on the ground, and I've seen the, the labor of love, right? Every single thing which has gone into it has been yes. kind of, uh, has been, it's been kind of done by hand. And so there's yes. a lot of love which has gone into this yes. conservation effort. And I, I think I can definitely testify to Gauri and his family who have been, uh, I would say Gauri is great, but his family is more patient, right? Yes. So I, think, <laughs> I think behind every successful man, there's a woman. So I think that an yes. entire family and a Sangha, we would say. Right? Yes. And I forget, yeah, and I forget, your, I forget your colleague's name. He's an amazing man. What's his name? Prashant. 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 Yeah. Good shout out to Prashant, him. Sharmila, my wife, they, right. they, like I mentioned earlier, I have a great team. Sharmila yeah. takes care of all the administration and stuff. Prashant right. is in the field and my son right. takes, my son is 10 years now. So he takes people for a walk and he's like a super naturalist. So we treat anyone who visits our place as one of our family members right. and they, they have to feel at home. 
So I think, so absolutely, it takes a village to bring up a child. So does it take yes. a village to keep a rainforest going, right? Yes. So one of, exactly. one of the things, when, when we're talking about resilience, and this is an important topic, we spend so much time about resilience of the body and mind, but we forget that if the air we're breathing, the water we are drinking, the earth we walk on is not protected, then there's absolutely yes. nothing you can do about your body and mind. You know, you're kind of screwed. So a couple of other topics I want to kind of, we have a few more minutes, I want to kind of go through this. Yeah. Considering now we have, with the lockdown and this kind of the human intervention, you sent me a beautiful picture the other day, you know, on, on WhatsApp about, you know. So how is, how is Agumbe and the Western Ghats healing? Do you see any signs, even do you hear about anything over the last four weeks, how the nature is healing? Oh, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, entire uh, India, I was, I was looking at, uh, I was watching the presentation of uh, Indian Institute of Remote Sensing. The director was talking. So entire India has healed for almost 30 days. The way it's shut down has taken on close to 30% decrease in the uh, nitrogen dioxide or sulfur dioxide uh, pollution you know, has come down. And Agumbe is do doing really good. But on this other sad part is uh, poaching has gone up, or uh, I would say hunting. You know, people are free. They don't know what to do. So they're venturing into the forest. So they are hunting animals. But I think it's a, it's a small, small number. But we don't have exact data to see how big that change would be. Because the villagers sitting at home, right at the backyard, they have a forest. So they just go into the forest and kill and come. The department people are busy with pandemic, you know. Yeah. The cops right. are busy with pandemic, so that's one uh, uh, disadvantage of the lockdown. But otherwise, uh, globally, India-wise, it's doing good. People have spotted uh, uh, gaur walking in Chikmangalur, some market, and uh, mm -hmm. the wildlife walking around on the main road, and they have a free passage. That's the best part, you know. Right. The, every every forest has a road, right. and unfortunately, I don't know why we create roads in the forest, right. and roads can divide the populations or. They have to wait for a whole day. They have to reach, I mean, they have to wait until it's dark to cross the road. But right. now that the roads are empty and the animals are walking around, they're walking into the villages with the rhino in uh, Assam, which is a usual cause because Indian cities, if you see Bangalore, we have 25 kilometers, we have Banagata, we have leopards, there's a tiger roaming around there, we have elephants, right. you know, we have jackals. So, right. so things are helping a lot for the wildlife, I'm sure. So I think this is one thing to note. If you know, if four weeks or six weeks have done this, six weeks, right? yeah, yeah. So what? So we can we know that we can with the right efforts. You know, obviously lockdown is quite severe, but if we make this effort to conserve, if conservation becomes part of our daily, like brushing your teeth, yes. it's a ritual, yes. right? Yes. If you learn to tread lightly. You know, yes. Gandhi said there's enough in the world for every man's need, except for one man's greed. Greed, right? yes. And yes. And I think we need to understand that we do not need to eat wildlife, or we don't need to add animals for a... We have enough, for, I would say, plant-based vegetation. Exactly. But it all comes down to stories, right? Yes. I mean, it all comes down to narrative and, you know, very seductive stories of uh, increasing your virility by eating, you know, a, a, a rhino's horn or whatever. Yeah. Right? Or yes. something like that, which doesn't even make any sense because these are just it stories. Doesn't. These are just doesn't, stories, yes. right? Stories. But these stories need to now. So I guess with your son growing up who's 10 years old, he's going to grow up with the story of like Mowgli, right? You know, coexistence, yes. habitation. Yeah. And I think uh, that's why I think these kind of conversations, Gary, need to happen. And I'm so grateful that we had the opportunity to at least share some of these things. So yes. what would be your vision? Uh, you would like to share, like you know, when you look at KCRE, your, your storm research, you know, if you look at you know the years ahead, these are very different times. And you look at what are, what are you thinking? This probably is giving you time for you to think too, right? So what are you thinking? <laughs> as, you know? no, right now, I'm not thinking because I'm uh, at the last leg of my PhD. So uh, oh, that's, that's right. going yeah. What's your, what's your PhD on? Let's talk PhD, about it. Yes, yeah. yes, that's that's what I was about to yeah. tell you. So I've been doing the PhD for almost seven years now. So it's time to conclude. Right. and tell the world what I found. So I'm looking at genetic variation of king cobras. Right now, king cobra is one species. It's just a monotypic genus from, from Western guys. That's from our Karnataka or Goa or Kerala, all the way to Philippines, the entire South and Southeast Asia. These rainforest islands, king cobra is one species. It was discovered in 1836. So almost 185 years, many scientists have speculated that there be different species but no one had ever established it. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to collect morphology data, genetic data across the Southeast uh, Asian countries 
and I'm trying to compare these genes and make sh- I'm trying to figure out whether it's one species or different species. Mm-hmm. So my uh, my preliminary research or result says that there, there might be many species, just not one. Mm-hmm. So how does this help? What if uh, a king cobra from uh, uh, Borneo or Sumatra or uh, Andaman Island or Western Ghat is different species, right? We might lose for another pandemic or such mm-hmm. tsunami or any man-made or natural calamities. We can we would lose the species before even we understand what exactly that species is. So that's yeah. what my study is. I'm trying Beautiful. to figure out whether king cobra is one or different species. So once I figure out that I'm going to propose to the policymakers and the governments, look, this king cobra is endemic to this particular island. We have to conserve it. That's right. fine. That's my beautiful. Own. And I think okay. along with that, I think my urge would be to filmmakers and uh, storytellers yes. and poets yes. to really also write narratives on snakes as, yes. as more endearing, yes. right? Yes. Because we are, you know, a baby who's growing up, you know, looks at a snake or whatever thing and says, okay, this is just a snake. It's just like another dog, another cat. Yeah. And yeah. just like anything else. And then the mom yells, snake, right? And then for the rest of the fear. life, the baby is screwed, right? Yeah. Because, yes. Because yes. that fear response and fear is false evidence appearing real, yes. right? Yes. It's like, yeah, the snake charmer is doing that thing and that snakes don't see, right? Don't see. They're thermal they sensing. Don't... The no, thermal, they see, they can't hear. They, they can't hear, sorry, yeah, they, can, they, can they hear. can't hear, yes. But they're mostly the thermal sensing, right? They, yes. They sense, yeah. so it's not like the music is this. beautiful music. They're not hearing no. this beautiful music basically being, uh, you know, put out there. So I think it's, it's time for us to, I think even from India, really, the snake charmer concept be, you know, reintroduced and this fascination yes. be kind of, you know, put in a positive light. What other things would you like to share or other outside of your research for KCRE and how do you see the conservation, the online program you're launching, are there things you're planning for the next, you know, couple of months coming up? Yeah, uh, right now we are right in the middle of uh, Wild IQ. It's for uh, kids who are between 13 and uh, 16, so it's going good. We are trying to introduce to them to the wildlife, and I'm getting all my friends and colleagues, my peers from all over the world with whom I've collaborated or worked, and they're talking to these kids about their interesting taxa. Today, we, uh, our friend Aditi, she was talking about bats. She's right. working in Caribbean Island. So it's interesting. Yesterday, we had an interesting uh, discussion about uh, turtles. So the, my our KCR is two objectives. One is research, trying to find out what these natural uh, systems are, how they're, they're working. The second thing is to reach out to people. So we want a whole bunch of people, everyone, like you mentioned, we all need fresh air fresh water, everything. Whether you do mathematics or physics or chemistry, you definitely need fresh air and water. Right. We have to know where this comes from. Right. If you see now, just with the 20 or 30 days of shutdown, we are breathing fresh air, right? right? So that's important. So we try to take this message to every single person in the world. That's our objective. And we do our best to reach out to people. Through online, through practicals, people who come there, they stay with us, and then they know the difference where they live and what they want to do in future. Absolutely. And then, so I think for people listening, follow KCRE on Facebook. Please and do. I'll, yeah. I'll, share, I'll share the links and do reach out to Gauri Shankar. He's always willing to help and share his yes. knowledge. I want to end with maybe a story you can share. You've done all these different Nat Geos and this and Discovery. Is there one incident or one story uh, with a King Cobra which you say is so special? Oh, uh, many, actually. I would say one, once I was filming... Uh, uh, on male and female, and uh, we were there for 30 days, just living with them, you know. Mm-hmm. I had pitched my tent there and uh, sleeping right next to them, like maybe 30 feet from them. Oh, yeah, so we, people, 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 people do it all the time. They just sleep next yeah. to the King Cobra, just like King Cobra. <laughs> just for 30 days. Why not, you know? And every day morning, 7 o'clock, I would wake up and just sit right in front of that burrow, and the male would uh, stare at me, okay, today you're still here watching us, yeah, okay, it is, that's the kind of communication. And once I was just with my tripod and trying to shoot, and this guy suddenly appears in my frame, and it was too late for me to grab my tripod and run, because I don't want to panic him or startle him, you know, because I don't want to lose the data, because I've been following him for a long time. So if I startle him, then he might take off, leaving the female behind, which is not a good idea. So I just stood there, did nothing. And this guy is about... 
at the five meters, five, I mean, uh, the five meters distance, the snake was about three or four meters, huge guy, like a, this big, like a bulldog, you know, he's, uh, I'll tell you why I know this looks like a bulldog. He came all the way close to me. He looked at me and I was standing there with my camera like this and he came, he touched the tripod and then he started, we call that as tonguing. They put their tongue out to collect the scent particles right. and uh, it's communicated to the brain through Jacobson organ. He was literally tonguing my shoe and then my trousers and all the way to my hip. I can see him like this, like right. this, right. like this. Right. And his head was this big. Right. And he, I mean, it, I, I think no viper or a python or a, a cobra or a rat snake would do this. And right. this guy came close. He was investigating, you know. Right. I was, so I didn't want him to climb up. And then right. I would be like uh, Shiva, you know. <laughs> uh, the god Shiva, if he's yeah. right here, right? Yeah, right. it'll be too late for me to bring him down, you know. Right. I'm, I'm sure he's not going to bite me up, but yeah. I didn't want to take chances. So I just stepped away from him and right. he looked at me. Why? It's okay, I'm just checking you, you know. I'm right. just trying to know what, what you're doing here. So yeah. it was such a good expression. And then he gently went back. So that, I would say... Is... You know, this is, you know, listening to you, you talk about energy, right? Energy, An yes. anim animal sense, you know, before yes, they do. You know, there is this whole thing, research, which says 60% is our body language, right? Yes. 30% yes. is a tone. And I know yes. even and very little is language. In fact, language yes. comes in the way of any of any emotion. Exactly. Right? exactly. So I I believe that if you come from a space of I'm not here to harm, and that's a fundamental yes. energetic yes. exchange, right? And I think Yes. And you realize you go to the farm, sometimes when you are scared, animals sense that fear. And you probably see yes. this with young people who are trying to handle or try to yes. uh, grapple exactly. or, or, or wrangle yes. a snake. Wrangle a snake, yes. They're, they're probably, that fear and tension is also coming on the snake and the snake feels it, right? But yes. when somebody else has a calming, when you and Prashant go, it's like, okay, but these guys are helping me out. They won't let me go in a few minutes. Exactly. All good. All good to yeah. go. So I believe I that there's you know, something to think about. Yeah, people do tell me like uh, when you, you hand like King Cobra, it's like a dance with it. You know, yeah. you, you both are dancing, you and King Cobra. So that's because we have an understanding, you know, I don't yeah. cross that branch. He doesn't cross that branch. Yeah. He doesn't bite me at that particular. But that doesn't mean that I take advantage. I right. disrespect them. I respect them so much. You know, or like you mentioned, we don't need to talk about the body language. Says, okay, I'm here to pack you into the bag and release Right. away from this particular chaotic situation. That's all. So I do it in 30 seconds, 40 seconds, the snake inside the bag. Right. So it's important. So, so once again, Gauri Shankar, uh, thank you so much for your time. I think the conversation is invaluable for somebody who's rescued over 350 king cobras and released them <laughs> so that they can have a better future. And that, yes. so, so that we do not see these cobras in virtual reality or on only videos. It is so yes. important for us today. We have borrowed this fragile planet Earth from future yes. generations, right? It's not our, it's not, it, we, actually no. leased, we have leased it, right? We've leased it, yes. And we cannot, we cannot or drive this car down before returning it. So I think, so let us tread lightly. And I, it's also important yes. for us to connect with people like Gauri and the amazing work he's doing to realize that how intrinsically we are all are connected. And I can exactly. say, if the Western Guards, if these rail, railway roads go across Agum Bay, Kuru, this very dense forest, the last bastion of, I would say, the flora and fauna being preserved. Humanity, it's not just India, it's not the Western God. No. Humanity will lose something and we will suffer, right? I think so. That's really my earnest uh, conversation today on building resilience of the environment. So, Gauri, thank you from Bangalore. I know it's late for you. Love to you and the family. Namaskara, Sonu. Thank you. Namaskara, Sonu. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Pleasure talking to you. You too.